Yeah, uh, my voice is quite loud already. I definitely do not need a mic, <laughs> unless you all want to suffer. It, what happened at, um, as the story continued is that uh, David proceeded to uh, force me to defend the importance and physical meaning of Bose-Einstein condensation in ultra-cold quantum gases uh, for the next two and a half years every week. <laughs> so, you know, and I think many years later, he actually, after I graduated, he wrote a paper in which BCs appeared. So I, maybe that was some sign that he finally uh, believed. But anyway. Then he got the Nobel Prize. <laughs> then he got the Nobel Prize, right? Small, small thing. So, okay, great. So um, I'm going to talk about a problem that I've uh, worked on for something like seven years. And actually, this problem is an extension of a problem that came out of conversations with um, uh, another Nobel Prize winner, as a matter of fact, uh, Bill Phillips and, and Trey Porto, who is here. Um, and so I don't know if any of you, have, uh, I don't think Bill is here today, but I don't know if any of you have ever like, uh, tried to answer one of Bill's questions. Uh, but it's taken me some time. And I'm not sure I totally have an answer yet. But anyway, this is a continuing series of answers after about 11 years of spending eight hours talking to Bill Phillips. So be very careful when you have a conversation with him. You may have to develop a career around it. OK, so um, this is on many-body quantum chaos of ultra-cold atoms in a quantum ratchet. I will clarify all those terms. This work is a collaboration between myself, a student, and a postdoc, and a wonderful group at Competenza University, uh, the group of Fernando Sols, and some students and uh, faculty there. OK, so uh, this is my group at Minds, and I want to start with an advertisement. Uh, these are the, this is the student and postdoc working with me. And I should mention that uh, we have 14 PhD positions open right now for starting uh, this next fall. So if you'd like to apply, we would love to get applications. Uh, we've hired a big quantum group. And uh, Joshua, uh, where, where are you sitting, actually? Right. Could you just stand up for a second? Because we, I hope you don't mind. We stole like one of the best young physicists in the country who happens to be at JQI from you. Uh, but, so we feel very grateful to JQI. And we also have a position open for an experimentalist. So if you're a postdoc and you'd like to join our, our big effort, we have a new $50 million building, you know, big quantum theory lab, lots of quantum experiment space. You know, it's, it's a really nice effort at Mines. Um, and, and at Mines, we're very proud to have some outstanding uh, students, some of whom have come here. Um, and I believe one of them is in the audience. Hillary, could you just stand up for a second and say hello? Does everyone know who Hillary is? We try to send our best here. OK, so we're very happy with what we're doing in quantum at Mines. OK, so today. I'm going to start with uh, kind of a review of what we mean by chaos and some of the ideas around chaos. Of course, in an hour, I cannot do an entire class on chaos, but I'll just give you a taste of particle chaos and wave chaos, and then what do we mean by quantum many-body chaos, which is somehow something else, at least in my view, and I, I believe Victor's view and some other people in this room. Um, and then I'll talk about a case study where I can explore those ideas, which is the quantum ratchet. And then finally, we'll, we'll end with some conclusions, but also some open questions that people in this room could do research on right now, things that need answering right now. Now, maybe Victor will stand up and say, oh, I know the answer to all those questions, in which case you can all publish with him. We'll see. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I think there are pretty significant open questions about quantum anybody chaos. OK, so I just want to remind you, in chaos theory, uh, one of the main paradigms is the Lorentz model. Um, and so this is a picture of uh, an, uh, um, an attractor in a 3D space. And the 3D space is governed by three coupled ODEs, the dot means a time derivative. Here are the three coupled ODEs. Uh, R is the scaled Rayleigh number. It's flipping conduction to convection. There's sort of two things going on in this space. And in general, the uh, Lorentz model uh, deals with, uh, uh, let me go back. The Lorentz model deals with um, a roll in the atmosphere where you've got some kind of circulation and you can have conduction. OK? So, so you can go back and forth between those two processes. And if you drive, uh, are far enough, something interesting happens. And then P is what's called the Prandtl number. It's the ratio of momentum to thermal dis diffusivity, which are both going on this problem. X, Y, and Z are three variables that govern this motion. If you like, at the end, I'll give you the details. So generally, we characterize trajectories in this 3D space um, by the Lyapunov exponent lambda, where you have some uh, uh, you know, vector in the space, X, Y, Z. And if you start with two initial conditions that are close to each other, they eventually diverge if gamma is greater than 0. So that's the idea of the Lyapunov exponent. So when we say they diverge, it means they, they both land on the strange attractor, but they, they move separately around that attractor. OK? OK. Um, so in particular, here's sort of the role. And, and, and there's you know, uh, uh, convection each way. And then there's conduction down the role. Um, and, and we sort of think in this space that we have things like uh, fixed points, right? 
where you, wherever you start in the space, you land on conduction or you land on convection. And then we have something called a strange attractor, which is if you push uh, R to be big enough, you, you develop this structure and, and things diverge. OK, so that's just a kind of basic paradigm of chaos. And uh, the butterfly effect is not actually about butterflies flapping their wings. It's actually about this shape, um, which is called the Lorentz butterfly. and looks like a butterfly. OK. <laughs> so um, all right, so now let me remind you of some things from classical mechanics. Uh, we'll start with the single pendulum, which I think everybody has seen. So here's my cheap drawing of a pendulum. And there's the governing Hamiltonian uh, with p the angular momentum and theta the angle. OK, and I want to remind you of a couple of things that you may or may not have seen, depending on what kind of classical mechanics you're doing uh, here at Maryland and what classes you've had. So uh, you, know, you start with p and q, and this is the phase space right, for the pendulum. Those are sort of the closed trajectories where the pendulum's doing this. And then the, the ones on the top are where the pendulum is flipping around, like this. OK, so there's rotation and nutation. Uh, and then you can kind of unwrap that in terms of phase angle variables. So you can unwrap phase spaces sort of generically. Uh, and then if you perturb this phase space, OK, so, so, so j, j is a kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's like the integral uh, dqp. And then phi is like something related to omega t, where omega is the frequency of the pendulum going around. So that's the idea of those variables. So that's called Hamilton-Jacobi theory. If you put a perturbation in that space, generally you can smooth that perturbation with a new transform. And again, the things that flow smoothly in phase space. Okay? But if that perturbation has poles, yeah, then you can't smooth it. Those are called essential disruptions. And you can just wrap up those disruptions in these little tiny pendula. And if those little tiny pendula occur in different places in, the, um, in, in this transformed phase space, uh, and they start to overlap, we call that the Chirikov criterion for when they overlap. Okay? And when they overlap, we say that we've transitioned from something that's you know, either integrable or mostly integrable to something that's chaotic. Yeah? So that's called CAM theory, basically, okay? that you need enough of a disruption, and the disruption has to be essential, and then you end up with a transition to chaos. So that's kind of some basic paradigm of classical chaos. Now, those of you who have worked on this problem before know that, hey, this is a 2D problem. You don't actually have chaos. That's just a sketch. To really get chaos, you need more than two variables because you need trajectories to be able to be tangled up in a Hamiltonian system. Okay? So the paradigm for that, the easiest way to do this, is to do two coupled pendula. So these are my two coupled pendula. And now if we just linearize this problem, right, we wouldn't see chaos. Right? That'd be sort of the normal mode problem. You know, the pendula either do this or they do that. Right? It's the normal problem everybody solves. Okay? Uh, but if the uh, coupling between them starts to have some kind of interesting disruptions, we can go through the same process. So of course, for Pendula, it's already a 4D space. And I apologize if these sketches are a little less than visible. Um, uh, but hopefully, you see that there are some Qs and Ps and Q1, P1, and Q2, P2 are the angles and the angular momenta. Right? So if I take a cross cut through that space, that's called a Poincare section. And I'm doing a cross, th th cross cut through the Q1, Q2 space. And if H interaction is 0, this is quite simple. There's just four dots. Okay. Um, uh, and, and then if I try to, try to put this in this uh, 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 action angle variable kind of space, I can unwrap it. And then I see these sort of uh, uh, wrapped up tori. Okay? And uh, they're kind of cross cuts with different values of J2 and J1. Okay. Um, so if I have a disruption in this space, I couple them with epsilon v, right? some kind of coupling. Then I'll find out that those essential disruptions I can again wrap up. And those are these little, little circles, these kind of little mini pendula. And if there are several of these and they overlap, again, you, 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 know, you, you meet the Chirikov criterion, you transition into chaos. OK, so that's just an, a totally basic sketch of what CAM theory is. Now let me say, in classical physics, if I ask about um, you know, ways of, of characterizing particle chaos, I would start with Lyapunov exponent, like I just showed you, butterfly effect. Hopefully that was clear enough, right? Um, and the next thing I would think about, probably, would be chaos versus integrability on the Chirikov criterion, right? And that is including CAM theory. Now, we have no viable generalized quantum CAM theory. So number one theory of classical physics, Hamilton's external, external action principle. Number two would probably be CAM theory. And yet quantum mechanics is not, doesn't have a generalized limit or a way that we, you know, we get back classical physics. So if you think that quantum mechanics always gives rise to classical physics, already we have a problem at a very, very basic level of just two coupled pendula. 
Okay, so that's part of what this talk is about, is looking for some sort of answer to that problem. Okay, um, other things we think about I didn't show you would be like bifurcation diagrams, like the period doubling route to chaos. Uh, Poincaré sections, I showed you just a picture. That's just like a slice through phase space. It's how do we deal with these high dimensional problems. Generally, the, the cross section in, in a Poincaré section is interesting if the problem is chaotic, okay? Uh, we talk about fractional dimension in those problems, and I have a lot of papers in this area. You can ask me about it after, but this is how we kind of quantify and identify chaos from an actual time signal in an experiment, okay? And then finally, as I mentioned, you know, usually fixed points and linear stability analysis go into the identification of chaos. So all of that is sort of particle chaos, right? Particle chaos, all right. So, um, and of course there's universality. So to summarize, particle chaos takeaways would be uh, chaos appears random, but it's not. There's this hidden order. That's the strange attractor, like the Lorentz butterfly. Uh, chaos can be well characterized mathematically, and there are multiple features, not just one. It's not just one number. There's a number of things going on. Okay. Uh, chaos doesn't require new physical principles. The most important two would be Hamilton's external action principle and then CAM theory, which you can derive from there. Uh, and then finally, I want to mention that chaos is very common in nature. For example, you know, chaos has a role in thermalization via ergodicity. So it's a very, very basic common thing. Okay, that's particle chaos. That's my four slide review of particle chaos. So now let's talk about wave chaos or what's often called quantum chaos, okay? All right, so if you want to understand quantum chaos, the easiest way to do that first is to say, well, um, you know, the universe has a pixel size. You know, like everybody is zoomed in on the pictures that they take with their phones or the cameras and it gets blurry after a while, right? Because there's a fundamental pixel size. And the pixel size of the universe is this delta x delta p. It's, it's the uncertainty principle, right? That's the pixel size of the universe. So there's some smallest, you know, sort of pixel in phase space and that's gonna tend to blur if these are two trajectories that are separating out, right, it's gonna to tend to blur how they separate out. So already a wave chaos has to take that into account, right, because quantum mechanics is the study of probability waves. Okay, so one way to do that, a famous way to do that, is to ask about a particle moving in two different shapes. If you have a particle and it's bouncing around with a circular boundary, it's an, you can show it's an integrable problem. If you have a particle and it's bouncing around in a stadium shape, you can show that that's a chaotic problem. Okay, that's called the Bunimovich uh, stadium. And then if you ask about wave chaos and what happens in here, you know, things look significantly different, but you can try to relate this wave chaos and maybe some limit from this guy into this guy, and that's like a whole field. So that's the sort of paradigm that people think about for wave chaos. Uh, they look for typical shapes in here that are called scars and things. It's a really nice problem. Okay, a lot of people think this is about quantum mechanics. It's not about quantum mechanics per se. You can do this with light, you know, in a material. Okay, all right, so when we say quantum chaos or wave chaos, right, if we try to really define that mathematically, the next step that we take past this idea of a pixel size in phase space is we say, all right, uh, let's try to define some sort of limit to so-called classical or particle chaos, right, in which h bar goes to zero, okay? And so, for example, in the quantum problem, we would solve h psi equals e psi, where h is p squared over 2m plus v of r, and v of r might be, for example, that Bonovomich stadium, okay? And then we would find the eigenvalues, e sub i, we find the differences between these eigenvalues, and then we do statistics on those differences, and what we'll find is a problem which limits to uh, a classically integrable problem shows Poisson statistics, and a problem that limits to uh, a particle or classically chaotic problem shows Wigner Dyson statistics. And in particular, do you see this hole? Let me tell you the experiment my colleague did to make this happen with classical waves. He took a block of stone. I'm in the school of mind, so you know we like rocks, right? So he took a block of stone. He excited acoustic waves in this stone with a laser. And then he started shaving the edges, the corners, right? And what he saw is he started with Poisson statistics, because he could measure out the eigen spectrum using laser, just like when you listen to a window. I think we're near DC, so probably you all understand that. You can use a window to listen to people with a laser. Okay, so, and yeah, spies and all that, right? So, so what happens is you, 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 you know, this thing will just drop down and slowly head towards zero. It doesn't happen instantaneously. So you kind of tune from one spectrum to the other as you go from a regular shape like a block of stone and you literally shave off the edges. That's a really nice experiment by my, by my colleague John Scales. So that's called level repulsion, okay? And so really different things happen in wave or quantum chaos than in particle or classical chaos. And I'll give you an example. And I know that Victor has worked on this area quite a bit. 
And an example is the kicked rotor, right? So if instead of you know, this particular V of R, I take a V of you know, X comma T and I just solve the 1D problem, right? Where you know, every sort of uh, integer time unit, I, I give a K cosine X kick right, to the problem, I'll find out um, in classical or particle, particle sort of problems, the energy grows without bounds. So that's P squared over 2. So that's like kinetic energy. Just grows and grows. Because I just keep kicking it and kicking it, and it goes faster and faster and faster and faster. right? But in wave chaos, it actually gets stuck. So it grows to energy, you know, a certain point of energy, and then it can't go anymore. Okay, so there's a really, there are really different effects in wave chaos as compared to particle chaos. Okay, great. But wait a minute. This is the Joint Quantum Institute, right? So you guys know that quantum physics comes in two major forms. And the first one is the stuff that all happened before JQI, right? <laughs> That's called single particle quantum mechanics. I hope you're not just doing single particle quantum mechanics here, right? So this is like 1920 stuff. Of course, it took us a long time to work out the details. But you know, wave becomes a particle. We have a nice you know, quantum classical correspondence. Uh, we use the language typically of first quantization. There are lots of special functions involved, which you know, I enjoy. Um, and it's a very pretty problem. It's h psi equals e psi, you know, where h is p squared over 2m plus v, and you have the Schrodinger equation and all of that. But the Joint Quantum Institute exists for a reason, because this problem is much harder. And we haven't fully solved this problem. This is the many-body quantum problem, right? And in the many-body quantum problem, instead of a wave becoming a particle, an entangled state sometimes becomes a classical wave, and sometimes it does not, right? Um, we typically use a language more of second quantization. <coughs> typically, instead of special functions, we're thinking about big matrices, solving big matrix problems, right? And then we're solving h psi equals e psi, where psi, for example, might be represented in this Fox space, where n is the number of particles in you know, modes 1 through l. For example, those might be locations in a lattice or momentum modes. And an example of such a Hamiltonian, this problem would be the Bose-Hubbard Hamiltonian. Here it is. Okay? And so for the Bose-Hubbard Hamiltonian, we have the kinetic energy. That looks like that. We have the potential energy. That looks like that. But we also have something new. We have interaction energy. So that's what makes it many body. So as soon as you put interactions in the problem, something new happens. And one of the big things that happens is um, you, you get a very big problem. It grows like the local dimension to the number of modes, or d to the l. That's the exponential problem. That's why we're trying to build these quantum computers. Okay. So that's the hard problem that we're going to be talking about today and trying to understand what does chaos mean in that problem. Because that's not the same as the two things I just reviewed. It's something else. Okay. Um, fortunately, even though that's a big problem, and we can't do that much on a classical computer, we have lots of quantum simulators. And uh, here's an example on a particular kind of architecture. There are eight or ten different architectures, and maybe 300 plus quantum simulators in the world, but the Bose-Einstein condensate architecture is one of the best developed with lots of different implementations. So from early realization, and I just had to put NIST here, of course it also happened in other places, but this being JQI, I wanted to mention NIST, um, you know, to uh, BECs and optical lattices, as you've probably heard about, to, for example, even already demonstrations of using ratchets, what I'm going to do in today's talk. I think that's maybe 20, uh, 2008 or 12? I think it's 2012, yeah, that that, that experiment happened in Bonn. Um, you can make kind of hard wall potentials. You, you can tune interactions over seven orders of magnitude. That's a Rice experiment. Uh, we've get, you know, got wonderful uh, ring traps, and uh, I think Gretchen's in the audience, and lots of other people who've worked on ring traps. Uh, people have made Joseph's injunctions. That's going to be a very important component of this talk. This talk builds on the Joseph's injunction idea. And then people also make macroscopic superpositions, and they even use chaos to try to create some interesting dynamics. They use wave chaos, okay, to do that. Okay. So using those kinds of um, architectures, I'm going to try to address the following questions. First of all, in single particle quantum, a wave limits to a particle. In many-body quantum, something limits to a wave, right? Or does it? OK. What do we mean by quantum many-body chaos as opposed to quantum or wave chaos? Will level statistics, as in the Wigner-Dyson statistics and level repulsion I just showed you, will that be enough to diagnose chaos in the quantum many-body realm of, for example, entangled states? If not, what other tools might we need? Are they experimentally accessible? Or are they computationally accessible? Is chaos 
highly entangled, as some people in quantum information seem to think. There have been lots of quantum information proposals to use, entang uh, to use chaos to generate highly entangled states. Is that true? OK. If yes, uh, doesn't that mean that we don't have a good semi-classical limit? Because after all, classical physics is not highly entangled, right? So then wouldn't we have a problem defining chaos by some limiting process to a classical state? OK. How far can we really go on classical computers? I'm a theorist. You know, I don't have a wonderful quantum simulator at my fingertips in my lab. So what can I really do personally? And what can theorists do as opposed to the quantum simulators? And then finally, in, if we do need experiments, in what kind of quantum simulator experiments can we address these specific questions? Okay? And uh, if, it, you know, what would be the best way of doing that? So these are the things I'm going to try to address. I'll give you a taste of my studies and answers to these questions, and then I'll pose some open questions at the end. Now, I don't know your tradition of asking questions during the seminar at JQI, but I feel like I finished my intro, and it seems like a moment when people might want to ask a question if they have a question. OK, I'll go ahead and go forward. Now, now when I used to give seminars uh, you know, uh, at, at NIST um, that Charles would arrange, you know, at this moment, I would stop, pause to ask questions. Then there would be like three hours of questions. Then I could continue my seminar. So <laughs> this is definitely a, a different experience. But I did I, I, say it again. We learned our lesson. You learned your lesson. OK. So <laughs> you know, every time I went out to NIST, I had to budget you know, like an extra four hours of time for my talk. So OK. All right. Well, um, I'm going to build on Joseph's injunctions and two-mode physics. And these are the things that you know, I was discussing with, uh, with Trey Porto and Bill Phillips back in the day that led to you know, many years of conversation. And just to remind you about how Joseph's injunctions work, you know, obviously a you know, Nobel Prize winning topic, it, it's the idea is that you have a macroscopic wave function. You've got two modes. For example, they might be spatially separated. And they're coupled, let's say, through a tunneling barrier. So there's like two wave functions, and they overlap through this barrier. Okay. There are lots of experimental uh, realizations, many, many. They're used in squids, et cetera. Um, and then the Hamiltonian just has two parts, right? There's a single particle part. These are the two modes, and that's a destruction, and that's a creation operator. So the idea is that you can move particles from one mode to the other, OK? And then you have some kind of interaction. And actually, formally, in the condensed matter version of the Joseph injunction, it's a nearest neighbor interaction. And for us, it's an on-site interaction. But essentially, it's the same thing. Schematically, if I want to represent this, I've got two modes. Right, and they're coupled, okay, and then they can interact in each mode. And there are lots of different kinds of Joseph injunctions. There are ones where you know you have something where you actually have two spatially overlapping wave functions. There are ones where you have internal states that are say magnetically separated that form Joseph injunction. And then there are also orbital Joseph injunctions where you're really you know getting momentum states to interact, okay. And that's the sort that I happen to have worked on. So lots of Joseph injunctions, okay. Um, so the Joseph injunction is it a pendulum? If it's a pendulum, it's a very weird pendulum, OK? And I want to show you what that pendulum looks like and walk through the math for a minute, OK? So this is sometimes called, uh, I think, uh, somewhat in a silly way, the two-site Bose-Hubbard Hamiltonian for the double well problem. It's actually the same as uh, n spin 1 half fermions in, uh, in a magnetic field. Um, and uh, that's called the lipkin meshkov glip problem. And that's a very old problem in nuclear physics. It's also the Joshin Junction Hamiltonian I just showed you. Essentially, we're going to formulate it as n bosons in two single particle states. So let me show you the Hamiltonian. Here it goes. So the Hamiltonian looks like this, just what I showed you. I use B for boson. And so I've got two modes. I can flip back and forth between the two modes with coupling J, right? And then I have some interaction within each mode with some number of particles times the number of particle minus one. Everybody got the Hamiltonian? OK. All right, so I'm going to transform this Hamiltonian by approximating uh, these states as coherent states. OK, so I'll take these operators b, and I'll approximate them as square root of n e to the i phi, OK, where n is like a number and phi is a phase, OK? And uh, the total number of particles will be fixed. It's equal to n1 plus n2. So when I make that transform, right, and I expand in the number difference between the two modes and the phase difference between the two modes, I get the following Hamiltonian. OK, hopefully this looks fairly familiar to people. Um, so. Hopefully you guys see that this is like p squared over 2m, right? Kinetic energy. And hopefully you see this is like something times cosine phi. Looks like the usual pendulum. But the something is very weird. It's square root 1 minus c squared. So this is called a non-rigid pendulum. As the momentum changes, 
the length of the pendulum changes. It's like something that stretches, right, as it goes back and forth, except instead of stretching, it's actually shrinking. <laughs> so it's a very weird pendulum, right? Okay, but it's some kind of pendulum. And this pendulum has some interesting properties. Uh, if z is much less than one, first of all, we know that, that you know, it's not like we can, we can just expand this and we get back the typical pendulum, the z squared term will matter compared to that term. And if z approaches one, actually those two terms in this expansion, right, these two terms will somehow cancel and we'll get exactly a nonlinear effect. And so you can guess that since nonlinearity is associated with chaos, that something chaotic must happen as you hit that point, okay. Um, if zero is less than lambda less than one, we get the Josephson regime. If lambda is greater than one, we get the self-trapping regime, and I'll show you pictures of those. Uh, Josephson regime, you slosh back and forth between the two modes. Self-trapping regime, you get stuck in one mode mostly, stuck over here. Okay, those are the two basic regimes of this problem. Okay. So, now what I'm going to do is step beyond the usual, usual Josephson junction problem that I was talking about with Trey back in, I don't know, 2005 or six, um, and, uh, and, and just put in one more mode, okay? So just a little step past. And what I'm gonna do is, instead of just coupling you know, two modes, I'm gonna couple three. I'm going to use a quantum ratchet to do that. I'll explain what that is. And ultimately, I'll work up to, for example, six modes. I'll start with three and work my way up. And I'll look at something that can circulate both ways around a ring. If you wonder how that's made experimentally, it's just the kind of thing that Gretchen does. Um, probably my picture is a lot less clever than what she does, but here is a kind of a donut BC. And here's some sort of rotating field that's a little bit off center. And you can, from that, create a quantum ratchet. And that's detailed in our papers. OK. So uh, I'm going to use what's called the a generalized Floquet method. It's called the TT prime formalism. It's, uh, it's something like block theory, right? But it's happening in time, right? And then I just generalize it slightly uh, in, 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 a, in a, a bit of a technical way. But I'll show you the Hamiltonian that comes out. So it, you get out of three level time independent Hamiltonian on states zero and two other states I couple in that might be plus or minus one or plus or minus two or whatever. Okay, um, so is this like the Lorentz model? Because I mean, after all, right, my atoms are either sitting here not flowing, that could be like, I don't know, sort of like conduction, and then they can have currents either way, so maybe that's like convection. So is that like the Lorentz model with those three modes? Because that's what Lorentz model is, right? It's either conduction or convection one of two ways, and then it can flip chaotically, okay? So you might think that's the case, right? Because nu is zero plus or minus. Uh-huh. But in quantum mechanics, right, we actually have a 6D phase space out of those three modes, because you have amplitude and phase. So there's a little more to work with in quantum mechanics. But then you've got the normalization in the overall phase, so that is actually a 4D problem quantum mechanically. If you have three single particle modes, looks like a 4D problem. Okay, so if you have a 4D problem, is that coupled pendula? Because the coupled pendula was a 4D problem, right? So we're gonna explore that question, okay? Um, so uh, the ratchet is the thing that drives the connection between these modes, and the E plus and E minus is related to the amplitude of the ratchet drive. And I just wanna give you just one slide with a little sketch of a ratchet, and then if you like, I can show you details at the end. So here comes the sketch, okay? So ratchets are all over physics. Um, e. coli make little ratchets with their tail to move through things. You know, it's a problem in, in, in biological motors. Uh, ratchets are on the Great Wall of China. Has anybody been in the Great Wall of China who's been there? I'm sure jishuan has been there. I hope so. <laughs> if you haven't, you should go. Okay, so, so the, you know, when you go up the Great Wall, you know, they had wheeled vehicles. They don't have to slip down. So the, there's, there's sort of little tiny steps. And so you get directed motion and you don't slip back. Okay, that's an example of a ratchet. Okay, our ratchet breaks both uh, P symmetry, which is what I just described, but also T symmetries, and the generalized breaking looks like this, but the point is that you break parity in time. So if you break parity in time, you get, you, you know, let's say you start with a sign, if you add in some other sign, the sign sort of has a kind of cant or angle to it. The extreme example is like a triangular sort of wave that maybe also flows in some direction in time. So that's an example of a ratchet. So you would think, well, doesn't that tend to drive motion in one direction? But if you drive it the right way on resonance, it'll drive it in both directions, okay, and do a random walk. Okay, so that's the basic idea of a ratchet. There are um, ratchets involving friction and Hamiltonian ratchets. Here we're talking about a Hamiltonian ratchet. There's no friction in my problem. On average, energy is conserved. Okay, uh, so what does this look like in terms of Hamiltonian? Here it goes. So 3LS stands for three 
level system, as in three modes, just the next step past the Josephson junction. And I can uh, move from mode zero to plus, or from zero to minus, or emission conjugate with amplitudes E plus and E minus. And then I have interaction inside of each mode. So it looks like a completely generalized Josephson junction to three modes. And so one question is, what kind of level statistics will we see? Will they be Poisson or Wigner Dyson? Maybe we can use the methods of wave chaos for this problem. OK. Um, I'm going to look at the mean field limit. And the mean field limit is the appropriate semi-classical limit for this problem. That limit specifically is the number of particles goes to infinity, the interactions goes to 0, while n times u is a constant. So that is the appropriate classical limit. And we can see how well this problem approaches that limit, whether this problem looks like something where somehow this is like the h bar goes to 0 sort of version. But uh, uh, you, know, ha you have to do it differently for the many body problem. Sorry, why does n times u have to be a constant here? Um, it's a, it's a, it's the way that we take a mean field limit, it's an established way for weakly interacting bosons to get out of semi-classical theory is the best answer. Um, you know, uh, I don't know if I have a, a proof offhand for you, but I think if I walk back through some older papers, I could probably come up with that. So maybe we can talk about that after. Um, but yeah, well, well established semi-classical limit for the weakly interacting bosonic problem. That's not the appropriate limit for the general many body problem though. Okay. change the, the landscape in terms of we're calling it a generalized just injection that like the plus and minus and, and, overlapping. Right. And so 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 you, you you'll see what, what comes out, but the the original idea I had for this, it's gonna turn out to be wrong and I like to be honest about my, my misunderstandings, you'll see. But the original idea I had is that I would have two just injunctions that would somehow interact with each other through that that middle mode. Okay, so that's like the spring couple. Exactly. I wanted to do quantum cam theory and make a double pendulum, and I thought maybe a quantum ratchet would do that for me. It turns out to be a great problem, and I'll show you how it does and does not look like a, a double pendulum. But remember, the single just injunction is not a normal pendulum. It's a non-rigid pendulum. It's a very weird pendulum to start with. Okay. More questions? Yes. So um, is it really many body regime when you do mean field? It kind of maps into basically you know, two particles, a single particle. Uh, it's so, so absolutely, th th this is about a limit. I'm not only going to do mean field. I'll also do the many body problem, and I want to compare the two. I see, I see. Yeah. So no, that would be like, so in the same way that wave chaos limits to single particle chaos, analogously, many body physics limits to wave chaos, right? Where the wave chaos is, you know, nonlinear PDE. Okay. So I'll show that in some detail. Great. More questions. I'm glad people are asking. I guess they're finally excited about what I'm talking about. That's good. OK. So you know, again, do we recover a three-mode Lorentz-like model? You know, but it's a 4D phase space, so this is coupled pendula. What, what is really going on, right? So let me show you the many-body version. The many-body version looks like this. Um, you know, uh, sorry, let me show you the mean field version. The mean field version looks like this, where you've got these three modes. This is what Victor just asked about. Uh, but keep in mind, phi plus, phi 0, and phi minus has an amplitude and a phase. Right? So there's a lot more in there than just the three coupled ODEs like we saw for the Lorentz model. There's this extra piece. OK. Um, so again, you see that there's this diagonal part. That's the interaction part. And there's this nearest neighbor part. That's like tight binding, if you wish, in three, three modes. OK. All right. So it, do we have a quantum cam theory? What, what are these coupled Josephson junctions? Well, here's what happens when you run the same derivation I just did for the uh, two mode problem, but now do it on three modes. So there's the Hamiltonian. That looks like, first of all, there's a sign reversal because of the Floquet like or TT prime transform. So it looks like minus the Josephson junction. And then, you know, you have this term to deal with this overlap. So that's like the interaction. Okay. Um, and uh, again, we can approximate this problem as coherent states, right, with square root of number e to the i phi, where phi is a phase. The total number of particles is conserved. Um, and we expand each Josephson junction in number and phase difference. I'll call, call those uh, z plus and z minus and phi plus and phi minus. Okay, and, and z minus and phi minus look just like the plus there. So if I do that, here's what I come up with. And I know it's a mess. <laughs> but I want you to see how much of a mess it is and realize that this quantum cam theory problem is still very much open. Okay. All right. So, uh, you know, I've got the z plus squared. So let me use this so we can, because uh, I have trouble pointing here, too much coffee maybe. Um, that's a kinetic energy for the first Josephson junction. 
That's the kinetic energy for the second Josephson junction. They're clearly kinetically coupled, right? And, uh, and then I've got kind of a cosine phi plus and a cosine phi minus, and I've got some interesting non-rigid weight, but the interesting non-rigid weight is pretty complicated with this factor out front. Okay. And ultimately what this means is that um, our concept of two coupled Josephson junctions is not so useful. In fact, if you diagonalize the kinetic energy term, uh, if you try to diagonalize this by making some transform, it also doesn't work great. Right. And what you really have is you're forced into a strongly coupled pair of Josephson junctions. So that middle overlapping mode up there causes strong coupling and you cannot do quantum cam theory with this problem. On the other hand, having a strongly coupled system means we can certainly explore quantum antibody chaos in this problem. Okay, so that's what's going on with the three mode problem and underlying it. And now I'm gonna show you what happens when I really solve the quantum antibody problem. So here goes. Okay, so truly there are lots of angular momentum modes. So far I've been approximating as just three, right? But there, you know, I have three resonant modes, but I have a lot of off resonant modes. And so the full Hamiltonian, you know, this is really gonna be a mess because you know I'm a theorist and I like big Hamiltonians. It makes me feel useful and loved. Um, so here's the uh, position basis Hamiltonian. Right, and I go up to some number of sites. Uh, here's the actual ratchet Hamiltonian I'm using. There are lots of different ones. This is a particular one that's pretty easy to make in experiments. Um, in the classical limit, here's what I get in the mean field limit, and you'll see that's like nearest neighbor. You know, there's the onset interaction. This is nothing more than discrete, discrete nonlinear Schrodinger equation um, with some, you know, a ratchet potential. Okay. If I put this thing in momentum space, I couple lots of different momentum modes. The only way I get back to the Hamilton I just showed you, if I want the strongly coupled momentum weighted classical pendulum, I've got to take three K modes and make a TT prime flow K like transform. So that's maybe for the experts in the audience. If that seems too complicated, don't worry. But what you should know is that I solved this problem lots of different ways in lots of different bases. Okay, so here goes. All right, what I want to solve, I'm gonna treat for the moment six sites and circulation around these six sites. Okay, that'll be N particles on an L site ring. <clears throat> Um, it'll be driven by a ratchet potential. Uh, it's governed by a Bose-Hubbard Hamiltonian. I will solve that in position space and momentum space. I just showed you that on a couple of slides before I showed you the TT prime flow K-like space or time independent version and the mean field limit of each of these three. So like I said, I worked on this for a lot of years. I've solved it every single possible way. <laughs> Maybe there are new things to do on it, but I really wanted to do this problem thoroughly. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> one of my ideas early on, I, I happened, my group happens to support the uh, open source matrix product state code, something I actually started with Charles many years ago. Um, and that, that uh, code, you know, has now evolved a lot and, and, you know, used by hundreds of groups worldwide. And I thought I could just take this problem and blindly throw it in that code. I thought that'd be great, right? I could just, you know, press a button and that would come a solution, yeah? Because I have this well-developed code I understand. Well, I was really wrong about that. And the reason I was wrong is not because the problem is highly entangled, but because the ratchet puts high weight on many particles on site. And so the way these codes grow, they go like the number of time steps times the local dimension squared times the entanglement cubed, called the Schmidt number, times the number of sites. Well, it's not that chi was high, it's that D was high. So if I have, you know, 50 bosons, you know, the weight on, for example, 10 or 20 bosons on site is large, and that turns out to be very problematic. Okay, so MPS does not work well. The other thing is if we want to look for Wigner-Dyson st statistics, we need the full eigenspectrum. Right, and we're certainly not, not going to get that of MPS. MPS normally just evolves ground states, or you know, evolves a starting state in time, something like that. You don't get the full spectrum. You don't get the full problem. Okay, so I'm using exact diagonalization for that reason. Okay, which is not my typical method, but was important for this one. It's exact diagonalization of a big Hamiltonian. How do those problems grow? Remember, I told you this is a quantum antibody problem. And it goes really fast, and there's a good reason for the joint quantum institute. There's a hard problem. So here are the numbers. Okay, so. Size of the Hilbert space, or sorry, the, the size of the matrices I'm dealing with is n plus l minus one choose n. Quantity squared, because it's a, a matrix, right? So for example, 10 particles on six sites, six sites, I'm already at nine million matrix elements. 20 particles on six sites, you know, I, I, I have trouble putting that on a computer. I'm, I'm out of room, so it's already a problem. But fortunately, 20 particles in three modes, actually the number of matrix elements is pretty small. So I can do a lot of particles in three modes. That's why also that's a good problem to play with as a theorist. Okay. So solving salt PDEs is easy. So the semi-classical limit, the mean field limit is easy. Um, and then I need measures of chaos. 
And so, um, of course, we from the statics, we have the eigenspectrum I mentioned. We have the Lyapunov exponent. But this is a quantum mini-body problem we'd like to be able to use entanglement. Yeah, so what entanglement measures can we use? OK. Um, so ultimately, you know, obviously, quantum simulators are needed because of these numbers. But theory and simulation can provide guidance for these smaller systems. And that's really what theorists are doing now. They're sort of providing guidance for the quantum simulators to solve the really hard problems. OK. So now I'm going to show you lots and lots of results after this long setup. And then we'll talk about what these results mean and also talk about you know, what open questions are still around. So can I go forward with results? And you all know what I'm actually doing, hopefully. All right. <clears throat> so uh, this is the current as a function of time. And so in what's called the Rabi regime, I get kind of regular flip-flopping back and forth between two modes, for example, 0 and 1, right? Uh, but if I turn up interactions, uh, I'll find that I get these chaotic current reversals. Do you see how that's 1, 0, and minus 1? So the current is going this way, and then it's going that way, and then it's stuck for a while, and then it goes the other way, sort of like Lorentz model. Um, and then, do you see this is 0 to 0 0.5? If I turn up the interaction further, I get what's called self-trapping, where I get stuck in one mode, and I can't go. So those are kind of the three regimes of this problem, famously. They're the three regimes of the, two, of the Josephson junction, but they're also the three regimes of the three-mode problem. Okay? And what actually am I solving here? By the way, these are the Fourier transforms, so you can see there are lots of uh, Fourier modes in here. I'm solving the full gross Pitievsky equation. That's classical ways with lots of modes. I'm solving the three-mode classical problem. That's the strongly coupled sort of weird pendula. And then I'm solving the three-mode <coughs> Uh, quantum antibody problem, it scales nicely, so I can solve up to, say, 40, 60, even uh, up to 80 or 100 particles in that problem. OK. So what does this problem look like? What does this look like in phase space? What are the sort of Poincare sections, if you wish? OK. So uh, there are some parameters that control how close to uh, resonance I am for the ratchet, the way that I drive it. OK. Um, and so here's interaction. And you can see that if I plot the average current as a function of time, that you know, I get something interesting happening you know, for certain values of the interaction when I'm near resonance. Okay? Ratchet detuning means detuning away from resonance. Okay? And if I look at the average current over long periods of time, I'll tend to go one way or I'll tend to go the other way. But in this intermediate regime, I average to zero because I have a lot of current reversals. That's another sign of chaos. And in particular, if I go and calculate the Lyapunov exponent, I will see that that's what these black dots are, that it's 0, 0, 0, 0, right? Because it's Hamiltonian. There's no dissipation. But then the Lyapunov exponent turns positive in this regime. So I've clearly identified some kind of chaotic regime, OK, by usual chaos measures. Now, if I um, try to do some sort of Poincare section, I could plot something like, I don't know, a phase of one of the states um, versus the current. And I'll see that, again, in this intermediate regime, I have something interesting, whereas in other regimes, things are pretty boring. You know, there's pretty simple orbits somehow in the problem. OK, let's keep going. So now let's look a little more into the quantum antibody physics. Here goes. So I'm going to unpack each of these four plots. So let's look at level statistics. Do we get bigger dice statistics or not? And is it a useful paradigm or not? OK. If I use um, all of the modes, not just three, but I use all of the single particle modes, I completely get Poisson statistics in, 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 no matter the interaction. I actually do not say bigger dice statistics. So I do not see a sign of wave chaos. So perhaps people like Victor are getting very upset right now and saying, maybe you made a mistake on this problem because you should see Wigner Dyson statistics. That's what I thought when I first saw it. But then I went back to the three-level system, right? And if I did just the three-level system, I very clearly see Wigner Dyson statistics. And hopefully you all see level repulsion in that hole there. And it's most pronounced in the chaotic regime. Okay. Um, now. There is a parameter. Do you know how I, I mentioned the block of stone that my colleague did with the, the laser excitations and he shaved the edge off? So you should be able to tune continuously between Poisson and bigger than statistics, statistics. And so one way to tune that, here's the official equation, but it's called the Brody parameter. And so if the Brody parameter is 1, that's bigger Dyson. And if it's 0, it's Poisson. And so here's what happens as a function of interaction with this Brody parameter. So somehow that looks very chaotic. That isn't. And instead of a yes, no, now I have a continuous number that allows me to identify chaos. OK, that is done just for the three-level system problem here. 
And so this is 20 to 100 particles in the three level system. And we can talk about the start of chaos, where chaos is peaked, and the end of chaos, where start and end are defined by points of inflection on the Brody parameter curve. Yes, Victor. So what the ensemble do you get is G U E or G O E? So what, what kind of Bigger Dyson ensemble? So there are different, uh, different classes of Bigger Dyson. I'm probably clueless about this, and you can educate me. Yep, I don't know the answer to that question. So the Victor Dyson. Okay, Let, let's talk about that after. Yeah, you educate me on this. Yeah, obviously we have an expert in the audience. So I'm looking forward to, I told him before the talk that he would correct anything I had wrong. So there may be many things. But in any case, yeah, I, I use the, the sort of, you know, Vigner uh, Dyson to six, the usual over the literature. Um, and I don't know that, I, I didn't, wasn't aware that there are two kinds. So thank you. Let's talk about that at the end. More questions? Yes. How many modes are there in figure eight? Okay, so in figure A, I'm doing, uh, I, I did, uh, uh, you know, six sites up to ten sites, and so I treated different problems where I would have six to ten modes, not only three modes. And just to finish, and then when I when I do this problem, I'm taking the three dominant modes, the three resonantly connected modes in that six to ten site problem. Here I'm including all the modes. Here I'm including only the modes that are the resonant ones. So this includes all the off-resonant modes in larger problems. But if you just change the whole number, you actually see that figure A goes to figure B. If you change for Poisson. Uh, no, I'll, I'll, it, as long as I include off-resonant modes, I see Poisson. If I include, if I include only the, the resonant modes, I, I can see Wigner Dyson. So it doesn't depend on whether I have six or 10 or 12 or whatever. It just depends on whether I include resonant or off-resonant. There's no way you can interpret it. You can just include some of the off-resonant modes. You can actually see how this, this mostly changes from one to the other. Um, it happens, I guess it happens pretty fast. So you, you lose the level of repulsion right away, but I'm not sure about the four, four or five case, but certainly at least for six on it, it it's, it's always, always Poisson. But I could try four or five, that's true, instead of just three, right? Maybe that would tell you. Well, but it, it's also a reduced problem. So it's like including a, a it's like having a three site problem if I include only three modes and that's the whole problem, right? So now you're saying, okay, let's have a four site problem but include only three of the modes. So that's a bit of a asymmetric problem. So that may be a bit of an odd example. Um, so six is nice because I, I'm somehow um, keeping some symmetries of the original geometry in the problem. Okay, let's talk about that after. Okay, and then we can ask about the classical wave limit, which as I said is u goes to infinity, sorry, n goes to infinity, u goes to zero, and u times a constant. And you can see that, um, you know, what happens is that you really do zoom in on a particular start, maximum, uh, sorry, start, maximum, and end of the chaotic regime. Okay. Uh, so we've got a nice classical wave limit. All right. So, all right, well, you know, those are the methods of, like, wave chaos. What about quantum antibody chaos? We must have something else we can work with. So I'm going to show you a few measures. Um, so one of them is quantum entropy. So I just want to remind you that uh, the quantum entropy is minus trace real log rho. It's just like the Gibbs entropy, right? Sum of P log P. Huh? But it has to be generalized to deal with a bigger object than a probability. Yeah, which is this quantum density or state matrix, and so you need a trace instead of a sum, but otherwise it's the same. S equals zero if A and B are not entangled for an overall closed system. Okay. Um, there's depletion out of the Bose condensate. That's completely measurable, right? And that's the uh, number of the occupation of all the modes that aren't in the dominant eigenstate of the single particle density matrix, AI dagger AJ. Okay. And what that looks like is uh, when you do interference between two BECs, if you've got a lot of occupation of non-BEC modes, you, you know, you lose your interference pattern. Okay, so it's a very measurable thing. Um, and then finally, something called inverse participation ratio is very typical to look at in these problems. And it's, you know, it's defined this way, uh, the sum over the probability amplitudes of each of the quantum states, and then one over that, okay? And so that is, um, uh, that tells you sort of how much spreading you have in Hilbert space, how many of these probability amplitudes matter. So those are three quantum many-body measures I'm going to look at, and now I'm going to show you another slide of four panels. Here it goes. Okay. So um, these are the true many-body measures. Uh, let's look at the first one. So GS, GM, and GE are identified from that three-mode problem and from the mean field limit. Okay. And that's the start, maximum, and end of chaos. The average quantum entropy shows a strong signal in, uh, in K-space but a much less strong signal in X space. It's fairly flat. 
So already we see that something about the basis you do the measurement in affects how well you identify chaos with that measure. Okay. Uh, if we subtract out the classical wave and we look at just the depletion, now the classical wave should be the part you get in the mean field limit. Yep. Should be the part you get in the mean field limit, right? But if you subtract that out, you still see a signal of chaos. So there is some kind of chaos going on, right, that is not about the mean field limit. So that's pretty interesting. Okay. Um, if you look at the inverse particip participation ratio, it's certainly true that more of Hilbert's place is explored in the chaotic regime. However, uh, I can tell you, I won't show this to you here, it's not so highly entangled. It's kind of interesting, according to Schmidt number. And then, uh, you know, uh, Jushwan, I think, uh, very uh, astutely asked about finite size effects. Here's an example. You know, if I, if I increase the system from six sites to 14 sites, and I ask what happens to things like the average entropy or the average um, depletion, you know, it's fairly independent of system size. Do you guys see how that's pretty much the same color up and down? So that's showing that, you know, these aren't finite size effects. Okay, and I think that's what he was getting at. Okay, great. So if you try to put this in a table of numbers, you can talk about all the different ways that you could identify quantum many body chaos, including level statistics and some sort of mean field limit, and all the way down to inverse partic participation ratio. And the start, max, and end of chaos will actually be different numbers. So the way that you measure chaos will affect what regime you identify as chaotic. Okay, and these are like real error bars carefully done. You can read about this in, in, our, in our preprint under review at PRL right now. Um, and I, I just want to point out that some measures don't work really very well and other measures work really well, yeah, depending on what um, kind of measurement we're doing, whether it's position or momentum. Okay, so we know that quantum many chaos has many, many features and aspects that need to be explored and many ways of identifying it, some better than others. Okay, so now Charles gave me the five minute signal and I'm already at 54. I, I did prepare for a three hour NIST style talk. Um, you know, so I've got, you know, I don't know, 83 more slides. Um, but uh, I just, I just kind of want to show you something extremely important uh, and, and, and I think this, this I haven't put on the archive yet, so, and I, I've only showed it in public once before in a very small environment. It's never been recorded. So this is you know, pretty much fresh off the, the press. So you guys are getting the sneak preview of the latest result, okay? And I'm gonna actually skip past this so I can show you uh, a very important plot, which is the following. Okay, we can ask ourselves about uh, what happens as we move towards that mean field limit. So a lot of people identify chaos, not everyone, but many people like to identify chaos, math, applied mathematicians do, for example, in big fat reviews I've read, uh, by h bar going to zero for particle chaos. Or for wave chaos, by limiting to something that looks like particle chaos in, in, in the limit that h bar goes to zero, okay? And so they try to think about identifying chaos by the semi-classical limit. So now for quantum many body chaos, can we do that? So here's some real idea of when we can do that. And then there'll be some numbers because I think there are a lot of experimentalists in the audience who would like to know what those numbers really look like. So here we go, okay? So if I ask about the time, right, at which uh, the mean field dynamics of the chaotic regime matches the quantum many body dynamics, there'll be a time at which they diverge. And that's always some finite time for finite number of particles. So here is how the time grows as a function of particle number going to the mean field limit where n gets big, u gets small, n use a constant, okay? And uh, it's very slow convergence for a chaotic regime. In fact, if you look at, for example, what the current is doing, here is the mean field prediction, and here is what is actually going on in the underlying problem. Now, you see that this sort of damping effect gets further and further out as a function of number of particles. So how fast does that happen? In real experiments, will we see mean field dynamics? Will we see anything semi-classical or not? Okay. So uh, the actual fit, if we fit that depletion onset with a tanch, and if C is the turning point, right, then we find some kind of power laws in different regimes. So here's a regime where you have simple flip-flopping, here's the chaotic regime. Okay, so in the Rabi regime, mean field theory is true for numbers of particles that scale to the power 0.5. In the chaotic regime, it's 0.18. That is a very, very, very slow power law. What that means is, in practice, mean field theory will break in experiments in the chaotic regime even though it doesn't in the Rabi regime. So how can we identify something by a limit that we can't even measure? It's a very poor definition, right? And I'll show you some real numbers, okay? So for example, if the hopping time you know, is like two milliseconds and I do six sites, 
I have a reasonable drive period of 12 milliseconds. Hopefully Gretchen won't tell me these numbers are crazy. Um, I checked with some experimentalists, but you know, not all of them at your level. So here's a, a, you know, a half a second for the Robbie period. Uh, our scaling says a BC of 10 to the fifth atoms breaks mean field badly for the Rob Robbie regime at 40 seconds, for the chaotic regime at 15 seconds, self-trapping at 280. Okay, rubidium BC, reasonably you can imagine will live them longer than 15 seconds. The onset of this breaking can happen even earlier. Okay, so now I'm gonna conclude, okay? So here are some kind of partial answers. Uh, and so the first thing is, I treated strongly interacting coupled non-rigid pendula and I took the time to go through that derivation in detail with you and I'm happy to do more on the board if you like. So hopefully you understand that point. Um, I introduced some tools to observe quantum antibody chaos and explored them. That included depletion, which is highly measurable, inverse participation ratio, which is great for computation, and then quantum entropy, which you can do in experiments and also with matrix product state methods. Right. Um, the semi-classical wave limit is good for short times, polynomial and particle number in particular was like to the power 0.18, a really slow polynomial. So how can you define chaos by the least convergent regime? That's very suspect. Uh, Level statistics do diagnose chaos if you know where to look, right? If you know to look in the resonant part, you're fine. But if you're including all the modes, they get smeared out and you actually can't use level statistics. Okay. And then chaos, I didn't show that to you, this to you in detail, but it turns out it's lowly entangled, but still mean field theory fails at accessible times. Okay, so I'm gonna end with some open questions and because I'm at my five minutes, I'm just gonna leave them up and we can discuss them. Fisher can tell me if he already knows the answer to all these, but I think these are all great research topics uh, that need doing. Thank you very much. Thank you.